Um, okay, great to be here with you this morning. Um, as Lael said, seven minutes. Um, I'm not sure anybody could uh, provide an answer to how to end hunger in seven minutes. I can, I mean, this is a problem that's been going on since biblical times. Uh, I'm not even sure I could define hunger in seven minutes, but hopefully I can maybe change your perspective a bit. Uh, let's start off with a trivia question. Um, uh, that's yours? Okay. All right. Read that and get, tell me if anybody know who said it. Anybody want to venture a guess? No. No. That's the oh, Richard Nixon. Right. <laughs> um, food stamps were created by executive order, by the first executive order of uh, John F. Kennedy, his second day in office, it started as a pilot program. Uh, Johnson expanded the program substantially uh, during the war on poverty, but Richard Nixon really funded the program to the highest levels it's ever been funded. And in the 70s, about the time uh, Bread for the World was getting started, with an international perspective primarily, hunger in the United States looks like it was on the run. It was actually believed that we could end it. Um, in later administrations, particularly under Reagan, uh, cutbacks started to occur in funding the food stamp program. And the food banks were created in the early 80s as a response to what looked like an explosion of need because the food, the food stamps had been cut uh, and people that had been relying on it were showing up at church cupboards, church doors, asking for help. Um, but it's important to realize, I think, that it is possible to end hunger. And that's the, the most important thing we want to talk about. Uh, I have a lot of belief that we can end hunger. Uh, it's an important thing to actually believe. Uh, we, why do I believe that? Well, in the history of this country, and hunger goes back, as I said, to biblical times, this country has basically provided Universal education at primary level, universal public safety, uh, like fire companies that come and put out the fire in your home, uh, legal uh, representation if you get accused of a crime, all of that totally independent of whether you can afford it. That wasn't always the case. Uh, at the beginning of the country, you didn't get somebody to put out the fire in your home, you didn't get an education for your children, and you didn't get a lawyer unless you were wealthy enough to do it. If you were poor, you were just out of luck. But we, we as a society, move beyond that. We've also taken some other really big problems, like slavery, uh, child labor. We gave women the vote. All of those three things, before they happened, were considered in the general population as be, we'll never get rid of them. I mean, they're so ingrained with our society, with our culture, that the best we could do is maybe moderate them, make them more humane, uh, put some rules around it. But the idea of actually eliminating child labor or eliminating slavery was not really considered a possibility. We look back on those things now and we say, why? I mean, that, we're just absolutely crazy. So. If we're going to end hunger, I mean, this is, the Phil Abundance is 30 years old, as Larry said, and that's 30 years of hard work to relieve hunger. But the word is relieve hunger. We have done very little to end hunger. Mm -hmm. That is the problem next, the problem next week is the same problem that we've been facing last week. We really haven't done anything, and we haven't been engaged in any way to actually end hunger. But I believe we can do that. And some of these large movements that we've seen historically give me faith that we can. So how do you do it? Well, actually, there's very, it's very simple. There are three basic elements to this recipe. Uh, the first one is mobilize the social movement and demand an end to hunger. Now, we talked about you know, putting pressure on government, and that's all great. The problem is do not think that government will lead us out of this problem. Governments don't lead change. People lead change. People demand change. And the role of government is to institutionalize the will of the people. 
If you want to ask why the government hasn't done things, it's because we haven't forced them to. They will come kicking and screaming into this. Uh, so while we are keeping pressure on them, whether it's next, you know, the next uh, midterm elections or whatever, make no doubt about it. Real substantial change to ending hunger only happens when the government, our representatives, realize that you no longer tolerate it. And if they want to continue in office, if they want to basically get by, they have to figure out ways. It's not necessarily up to you to figure out, to educate them as to why. It's not up to you to give them answers. It's you to hold them accountable. Just don't tolerate it. It won't work. Just don't, don't allow it to happen and put that pressure on. The second element is you have to provide a set of viable working alternatives to the status quo. It is not enough in all these movements to say, oh, you know, we just, this is horrible. Child labor is just terrible. It's, it's a terrible thing. Uh, yeah, w women should have the vote. No, you have to show another way that you no longer have to tolerate that injustice. You have to provide a path to let them respond to the need. That's a critical thing. So for at Bill Abundance and places like the Food Trust, scalability of programs is a critically important element going forward. It's not enough for us to figure out how to provide food to children in North Philadelphia or provide a backpack program or whatever unless we can see in it scalability to a state to a national level. Because we're basically creating a set of responses that when we all hold the government accountable and they come screaming to us, what can we do? We can do this. We don't have to do this anymore. This this will work. This will scale up. The third thing is succeed small locally and then grow it jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And if you doubt that, look at the progress of the legalization of marijuana and the and the acceptance of marriage equality. It doesn't happen at a national level. If you look at women's suffrage, if you look at the map of women's suffrage, state by state, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, before the amendment went through, you will find that most of the West already had women's suffrage. A lot of states, a lot of counties already had given women the vote. This wasn't a big thing. It was like a wrap up to what had moved on jurisdiction by jurisdiction. The same way with marriage equality. It's happening state by state. Once you have something in one jurisdiction, all of the naysayers that say it can't be done now have a problem. Because you can say, well, it works in New York. New York didn't fall into the sea. I mean, you know, what, you know, works there. Once people find out that Colorado has legalized marijuana, and you know what? It's not, it's, car accidents haven't gone up. You know, it hasn't dipped down into Armageddon, and it's a good thing. Well, then the next state says, eh, maybe we can consider it. It's not that bad. So you start jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Uh, my hope is that in my lifetime, not necessarily that we'll end hunger in the United States, but we'll end hunger definitively in a place like Chester. Mm -hmm. If Chester can be the first hunger-free city in America, then I put incredible pressure on the city fathers of Baltimore and Trenton and Camden and everywhere else, because if they can do it in Chester, why can't you do it there? And so that's, that's basically the deal. That's it. Thanks. Okay, we have uh, some time for some quick back questions or comments or perspectives. Thank you. It seems to me, unfortunately, that the people who have gerrymandered district lines and uh, um, bought our congressmen have figured this out, too. So it feels to me like that's what we're up against. Uh, interesting enough, and I, as part of Feeding America, which every county in the United States has a food bank that has been assigned to the responsibility for that county. Uh, when we meet, it's like a congressional meeting. I mean, we have the representatives of these 200 food banks. It becomes obviously clear that hunger is not a political issue. Um, 
There are many Republicans that are opposed to hunger as there are Democrats that are opposed to hunger. So the gerrymandering really isn't the issue. Uh, it's really an issue of economics. The congressmen basically have a certain amount of money to spend and you have to figure out how to raise the perceived value of solving this problem compared to the perceived value of using limited resources to solve other problems. The question came up earlier, how, what do you do to that congressman that says, you know, charities are really the way to go? Well, we don't rely on local volunteer militias to defend our country. We don't take a big city like Philadelphia and rely on a volunteer fire company to put out fires in our high rises. Um, it is not, it is a substantial problem and it is beyond the scope of volunteer charitable resources. Um, it's like, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a malfeasant uh, acceptance of your responsibility to look at a problem, Mr. Congressman, and think that it's not your problem. These are your citizens, these are your constituents, it is your problem, give it up, figure it out. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How you doing? Great. Uh, I just have a comment. Um, about a year, about a year and a half ago, I was going around to the church with my church now, um, in North Philadelphia Presbyterian, I mean Bethel Presbyterian Church. Um, I went around there to get a bag of food because I was hungry. And I kept going around and getting, you know, getting the bags of food and bag of food. And then I became a volunteer there. Then I became a member. Now I'll be, uh, not this Sunday, but next Sunday I'll be ordained a uh, deacon. And I just want to say thanks to Phil Abundance because when we started our food break there, we only had seven people coming. Now we got an average every week of about 85, about 85. The last two weeks we had 122. And no, we had 114 last week, last Thursday, and the Thursday before that we had 125. You know, and for the, the, the food that y'all donate and the food that we buy allows a lot of people in my community to eat, you know, and, and some of them are so grateful that they get jobs and they come back and bring food back to the church, and I have to be one of them. So I just want to thank you. Well, thank for you. The Appreciate that. I wanted to grab the mic for a moment to give thanks to Grace Marable from uh, Bethel Presbyterian Church. She coordinates the uh, food pantry there, and she was profiled in Bread for the World's national newsletter recently because she helped to organize letter writing efforts by the volunteers and the guests who come to the, the food pantry there. And she told me some stories about how delighted the folks were to engage in that and grateful to get a response from Senator Toomey, which was, even though it wasn't a very positive response, just hearing from members of Congress gave them hope in the possibilities that the process might work. So thank you again, Grace. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment. I know that you're, uh, this afternoon you're gonna be the offering of letters and um, the food banks, Generally, our logistics entities, we were all about picking up the food. Um, when they started originally, the assumption was there's so much food being wasted in the American agribusiness that if we could just have somebody go out and collect all that food that was going to waste, we could use it to feed the people that needed it. And we didn't have to worry about getting the food to the actual people that needed it, we could rely on the faith community to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the locations. They became our retail outlets, if you would. So the food banks, which actually have the resources to, like Bread for the World, to do stuff, never really engaged our constituents uh, in a political mobilization. We're all about moving pounds and moving trucks back and forth. And I think what you're gonna be seeing in the coming years is that these food banks across the country are taking much more of a role in, like Bread for the World, mobilizing, mobilizing our donors, mobilizing our partners, and mobilizing our clients. 
Um, the 15,000 volunteers a year we use is actually an old number. That's up to 25,000 volunteers a year. We have, just in Philadelphia alone, over 120,000 donors a year. Uh, and every week, we provide food for about 75,000 people. And, we start, and, and that doesn't count all the people that hold food drives during the year, let alone the people that care enough about hunger to put a can of soup into that barrel. So we believe that the problem, the concern with hunger is actually an incredibly widespread uh, belief system. It, it, you know, we, we've got the people, we, they're on our side. The question is how do we mobilize them to a point where the politicians don't know what hit them. Uh, so we're very grateful for those organizations like Bread for the World that have been struggling to mobilize the, the political pressure because it's giving us sustainable models. And I think what you're going to see is organizations like the Food Trust, Phil Abundance, and the food banks, and Bread for the World are starting to come together in a coalition of leadership. Any movement, and I've studied these movements, it's, there's no one organization that leads a movement. It's a, actually a collaboration of leaders. So at Phil Abundance, we've realized that we can't lead this movement. We can be a leader in the movement, but we need Gail, we need Larry, we need, we need all of you to step forward and build that, build that movement up. So, all right. All right. <laughs> Anybody else? Last questions? We have one here. Nancy? Recognizing that this is, the oh, there's someone who has a question. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it could be more vocal. Um, going back to your second point on how you kind of um, mobilize efforts to um, um, to basically create solutions that pressure government to mm -hmm. actually make change. What are some particular um, programs that Phil Abundance has seen success with? Um, Probably the, the most typical one, it's early yet, but uh, it's been open for about six months now. The problem of food access and food deserts is a problem that face everybody. Um, we opened the first nonprofit supermarket in the country in Chester, PA, uh, right at the end of October. And uh, this was a community of 60,000 people, at one time serviced by five supermarkets uh, that all went out of business and left no supermarkets in the, in the city of Chester. Um, and for a lot of economic reasons, it was pretty clear that no existing commercial supermarket operator could be successful in, in that area. Um, and there are a lot of economic reasons, and if this was a business class, I'd go into great detail. Um, but we found that the elements of us being a nonprofit allowed us to acquire the capital to build one there, and our non-requirement to make a profit or have a return on investment allows us to operate at a much lower cost, and we could provide an entire array of nutritious foods. So if you walk into our Fair and Square supermarket in Chester, you'll see that it is making a significant impact in the community. It is economically sustainable without large amounts of charitable contributions year to year, and it is eminently scalable. I mean, all of the systems are scalable. So we're perfecting that model, but there's no reason we couldn't take that model and offer it to Baltimore, Camden, or Trenton, or Reading, or Atlantic City, or wherever. And by providing an entire array of products, and we're providing soda and chips, but we're also supplying fresh produce and fresh meat and dairy and frozen products. There's even a service deli. We have an in-store butcher. Um, we're providing that community an entire array of provisions, which is very different than the food bank world, where we are dependent on opportunistic donations. So with opportunistic donations, we can't provide reliability and dependability. Uh, or sustainability, but with a supermarket model, we can. So that's one example of a scale, you know, and we engineered scalability into that model from the get-go. Thank you very much. I want to say yay to that. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. All right. Okay, our, our final quick back is right here. Recognizing that this is a nonpartisan issue, is there anything that Phil Abundance is now doing to try to make voter registration 
kind of get pushed down to all of its constituents because it seems like these are people who need to be heard from and voter registration, particularly in what is becoming a voter ID state, is really critical. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things we've recognized in, in the Chester experience is that the population is really disenfranchised. They don't buy branded products, so marketers don't do research. Uh, they don't vote, so politicians don't care. Uh, and actually, we're actually surprised by some of the behaviors and the, uh, the anthropology of what is really a subculture. Um, and it's not surprising that if nobody cares about you and your vote won't matter, voter registration or actually voter participation is very, very low. So part of the long-term plan is to work in Chester to engage that. And you know, we're doing it a little delicately because we are a nonprofit. Um, and while we don't look at it as a political thing, we know full well that if we could increase the turnout by two or three points in Chester, it would be a big push to the Democratic Party, and that would probably give us problems. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to work in a way and bring somebody else like the uh, League of Women Voters in to kind of catch the flack from that, because we don't want to be seen as the ones with a political agenda. Uh, but what we're doing in other areas is, quite frankly, the middle class uh, also doesn't vote as much. And so the food banks, uh, say in Pennsylvania, have all formed together what, what's called now Feeding Pennsylvania. So we've come together as a group, primarily for government relations and political mobilization. Uh, so, we're, and that's, that's less than a year old, so we'll be seeing more and more activities, uh, things like scoring uh, politicians. So one of our goals is to set up a, an ability where we can take every congressional candidate, uh, whether they're an incumbent or, or either both parties, and score them on the issue of hunger. Don't take a position, but just say, this is, this is on this, this is our scoring paradigm. This is their score. This is the other guy's score. And, and now you guys make the decision. Okay, so. Thank you, Bill Clark. Okay.